main uh, focus of today is to talk about this uh, competition uh, and tell you how to apply for the funding. So uh, today, obviously, uh, we're all here. I hope you've had a chance for networking. And Nick, Nick, Nick Cliff from Innovate UK, who's the head of advanced materials at Innovate UK, will be talking about the Plastics Innovation Fund Towards Zero Waste. Nick's been instrumental in this fund, so please quiz him in all the breaks as to any nitty-gritty little questions over scope and what might be a good uh, project for this um, competition. And then we've got two people from Innovate UK, Philip and Julie, who will introduce themselves, I'm sure, but they will talk about the details of actually how to apply the criteria, the scope, etc. And then after that, we're going to have a sort of couple of people with roving mics, it'll probably be myself and, and Brian over here on my left, uh, for Q&A, any, any questions that you've got that come out from that, those presentations. And then I'll talk very briefly about how, how the KTN can help you actually apply for this, particularly if you've never done it before and you've not applied for an Innovate UK fund. We've got plenty of expertise within the room. Myself, Brian, and AJ at the back are all in the materials team. He's waving. <laughs> Everyone on the WebEx, AJ is waving. He's also, AJ is actually the person on the WebEx who will be able to field any Q&A questions from the WebEx. So feel free to um, contact him during the presentation. And then finally, after we've spoken about KTN activities, uh, Brian McCarthy will talk about a, a plastics packaging report that will be launched today. So there's more information for you, particularly if you're in the plastic uh, space. The WebEx will then finish, and then we're going to invite people to come up for one minute pitches. And I will be mean, it will only be one minute, just to say who you might be looking for in your idea if you do want to collaborate for this fund. Uh, after that's finished, it's lunch and networking, which will be in the restaurant uh, to the left as you go out the door. And then the meeting will close, but I'll be around if anyone wants any help to talk specifics that might have come out from the event. So without further ado, I'd like to welcome Nick Cliff, the Head of Advanced Materials at Innovate UK. Thanks, Nick. Thank you, Sally. Uh, good morning, everybody. So I'm going to start with a brief apology, which is if anyone here was at the Plastics Innovation Awareness event we did a few weeks ago, um, you're going to recognize some or most of these slides. Um, I have tried to change the jokes, so uh, hopefully uh, it will still be an entertaining, an entertaining 20 minutes. So I'm here today to uh, formally launch and brief uh, a new competition that we're running called um, Plastics Innovation Towards Zero Waste. I'm going to start by putting a little bit of framing around who Innovate UK are, uh, where we sit within support for research and innovation in the UK. Innovate UK has uh, been in existence uh, for over 10 years now. started its uh, life as a, an organization called the Technology Strategy Board with a very simple remit, to help UK companies and businesses innovate, to help them develop the new products and services, uh, take world-class research and convert it into sort of commercial offerings, uh, and help companies to scale and grow. Uh, our, we are public servants. Our money comes through the Department for Business, Energy and Industrial Strategy now. Uh, and for years and years, we were a sort of standalone, uh, non-departmental, publicly funded body. But now, from the beginning of this year, we are part of a new organization called UK Research and Innovation, UKRI. Uh, UKRI has been formed through the bringing together of Innovate UK and all the different research councils. Uh, so you have the Environmental and Physical Sciences Research Council, the Natural Environment Research Council, all of them. I won't try to name them all. But we're all now come together into one organization. Um, UKRI is chaired by Smart Warport. And so over the course of this year and, and the subsequent years, you're going to see subtle changes in, in how we work, subtle changes in how we make funding available to you, the innovators out there, but also hopefully better and more joined up support right from the academic side of things through out into successful commercialization. And in fact, it's fair to say that this particular plastic innovation competition was very much a product of working with the other research councils. And it's part of a wider piece of work, which I'll touch on later in the presentation, uh, for a much bigger package of support for the plastic um, sector. But what are, what are UKRI trying to do? Well, we are simply, we want to be the best research and innovation agency in the world. We really want to, to sort of take the world-class research that the UK is good at. Uh, 
and, and, and sort of push it out, get it, get it growing and scaling. We want to drive and deliver growth and productivity across the UK. And also, and importantly, not forgetting the importance of, of delivering social impact, societal impact, making the world a better place for all of us. So I won't dwell on these statistics, but um, this is specific to Innovate UK. Um, we're here to help. Since 2007, we've invested over 2.2 billion. The slide is a little bit old. I don't know what it is now. Probably three, three and a half. It's ticking up as we speak. 3.54 if we, uh, we add in today's. Um, we funded you know, thousands, thousands of projects across dozens of organizations. The projects that we funded, the projects that you guys will do, have led to jobs. They've led to growth. They've led to money coming back into the economy. So we're all very happy. At the moment, one of the biggest pushes that you'll see across Innovate UK and that we're taking the opportunity to mention at all our events is this thing called the Industrial Strategy Challenge Fund. So the UK government published an industrial strategy uh, around November last year. And it particularly set out how the UK was going to sort of grow and drive, how we were going to sort of move into this brave and strange new world that we find ourselves moving towards. And the Industrial Strategy Challenge Fund uh, is it, coming in waves, and it, it's part of our overall commitment to see total spend on research innovation in the UK reach that magic 2.4% of GDP. So at the moment, we're somewhere in the sort of somewhere between one and two. So we've got a ways to go. 2.4% of GDP is a lot of money to spend on um, innovation. Of course, one way that we can achieve that goal is to reduce GDP and just spend the same amount. So it's a little bit counterintuitive, but there we go. But if you look at the ISCF, uh, in wave one, we had uh, projects around medicines manufacturing, robots for a safer world, uh, batteries for clean and flexible energy storage affectionately known as the Faraday Challenge. So that's a huge multi-million pound, multi-year commitment to, to driving change in the electric vehicle battery market. Wave two challenges started this year, transforming construction, transforming food production, all sorts of challenges. But what you'll see, of course, is none of those directly really relate to plastics or circular economy or resource efficiency or those elements placed in there. So, but what we are doing is we're currently in the middle of wave three. So working across all the organizations that form constituent parts of UKRI, led by the Natural Environment Research Council, we are hopefully going to be submitting a proposal for a big, significant, multi-year program of funding specifically to achieve or work towards the stated government target of zero avoidable plastic waste by 2042. This is a work in progress at the moment. Some of the people in this room may well have already been involved in some of the early stakeholder consultation meetings, but this is really going to get going over the next few months and over the course of the summer. And one of the reasons why we're running this competition now is slightly hedging our bets, but the hope is that early next year we will be in a position to open and announce a big multi-year program. So some of the projects that we fund under this call um, may well, hopefully, fingers crossed, be a great sort of set of priming the pump for bigger projects so when this hopefully larger uh, ISCF challenge fund gets, gets underway, they're there ready, the, the projects are ready, the collaborations are ready, and there'll be more funding to come. So we turn our attention to plastic. Um, <laughs> a load of balls. Um, plastics. Plastics have been around for quite some time. Around about the mid 1800s, 1850s, 1855 is when we first started to create sort of commercial man made plastic polymers. Um, in fact, Alan Parks, who from the UK is credited by some as developing the first human made plastic, the patent awarded in 1862 for Parkersy. I've always found it interesting that plastics, in some respects, although they have all sorts of uses, were developed in a response to an environmental challenge. That challenge being there weren't enough elephants to kill, take their tusks, and convert them into billiard balls or combs or things like that. So plastic were in, plastics were invented almost to solve an environmental problem, which, when you consider where we are now, I find quite ironic. 
Um, but plastics is an amazing material. I mean, they are fundamental to our way of life. They are fundamental to the economy. We're absolutely coming from the position uh, that, that plastics are good things. I think Sally actually recently wrote a blog where she pointed out that if it wasn't for plastics, she'd be dead. And that's not because it's her job and she would have starved. It's, you know, the use of plastics in medical equipment. Plastics are fundamental to our current food distribution network, fundamental for medicine. They are increasingly important across all of the uh, electronic devices, which I've conveniently left on the table rather than being able to weigh. So what, but what we, the problem I think personally, and everyone has different opinions, is that plastics are so good at what they do. They're so cheap, they're so ubiquitous. You're so able to use them across such an enormous range of products that we've kind of lost sight of the intrinsic value. We, there isn't enough value in recycled plastic. What we need is to change the approach to plastic. You know, systemic change is a phrase that you hear a great deal. And what we're trying to do with this competition is support those innovative projects that do recognize and add value and, and try to close the loop on plastics to keep them out of the environment and back in useful productive cycles. It's challenging to do stuff as well with end of life plastics. Um, probably can't read the writing on that slide, but I suspect several, if not many, of the people in this room will recognize it. That's the, uh, a, a graph over time of, of mixed plastic bale price. This is the value of recycled plastic. Anyone who's involved in procurement or buying will look at a graph like that and go, blimey. It's really difficult to build a business model around the price of mixed plastic because we don't have the mechanisms, the technologies, the products, the processes that really locks in the value of plastic. We need to support projects that either drives reuse of plastic or increases the value of plastic, makes plastic more compatible with virgin resin. And hopefully we can start to smooth out a little bit of that demand and work towards a, a more circular plastic economy. So just gonna look back briefly uh, over the way that we funded innovation in this area before. So up until a few years ago, we ran quite specific funding competitions in Innovate UK. And I was fortunate not long after I joined to be able to run a competition called Recovering Valuable Materials from Waste, which had a lot of plastics projects in it, circular economy business model, which supported just that, allowed companies the time to properly research how they might do business differently, how you might approach, say, the challenge of food packaging in a way that didn't generate waste didn't generate waste, was more circular. So that's our attempt to, to, to the circular economy diagram. Um, and you know these are the mechanisms that we see as being able to deliver that resource efficiency approach. At the level of materials, we can look at reducing the quantity of materials used, but without compromising recyclability, or even reducing the number of materials used while still delivering the functional performance that you require. We might look at replacing. That could be replacing a less recyclable or a less easy to recycle polymer with a more recyclable polymer. It might mean replacing the constituent components of a polymer as we move towards biopolymers or bioderived polymers. We put a big focus on design. Design for recycling, design for recovery, or even just different design approaches to the systems that are underpinned by plastic, we're very interested in supporting. It's very easy off the top of your head to say, um, oh, let's get rid of plastic straws. I'm on camera, so I shouldn't have done that. But, you know, but who really does want to carry around a metal straw? We're not all weird like me. But, you know, but how, how else might you approach it? You know, designers are rarely given the opportunity to be let off the leash. If you talk to a designer, if you, and I have done this, if you show designers around recycling sites, um, apart from getting really fascinated by the weird blobs of molten plastic and stuff like that, the things that designers do. But if you start freeing them up to apply their expertise and their innovation to how you might change the design of food packaging, what they come up with is astonishing. It's just providing the opportunity to do those pieces of work. And again, you know, are the ways in which we can repair and extend the life of plastic goods? How do we facilitate reuse of plastic? Um, can plastics 
polymers themselves be remanufactured? How far back, close, and compatible to, 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 to virgin polymer can we take these things? Um, you know, these are all areas that, that we want to support. And also, importantly, ensuring that the opportunity is there to collaborate. Some of the best projects we fund have everyone from the polymer manufacturer right the way through the whole supply chain to the recycler. Because if you're fundamentally trying to change the way a system works, you need to make sure that everyone's bit is considered. If you ignore someone, if you ignore one part of the chain, no matter how good your idea, you are potentially setting yourself up to fail. So we funded a lot of projects. Uh, they range from things like materials innovation for a circular economy, to supply chain collaboration, to new designs for the circular economy, to recovering valuable materials from waste. Some of the people in this room I know received funding from those competitions. And this is the foundation that we drew upon when we developed the scope for this particular course. And we funded lots of interesting projects. Um, it's not a video, it's a picture of Steve Evans, who some of you may know. Um, but Steve uh, and the Institute for Manufacturing work with Dyson on, a, on a, a, a project in our new designs for the circular economy course. And that was, again, short, sharp design feasibility studies. It was one of the first competitions that Innovate ran that was explicitly about going back to first principles and just redesigning the way that something was done. And they worked with Dyson to examine whether or not Dyson, and a Dyson product is, well, it's not all plastic, but they're very heavy use of plastic. They use very high spec polymers. But they were experimenting with whether or not they could implement and utilize and build Dyson products from biopolymers. And it was a really interesting project because they found out that actually they could. Some of the biopolymers that they were developing were capable of delivering this super high performance that Dyson products require. But also, because Dyson have a somewhat different relationship with regard to how a customer considers their Dyson product, Dyson realized that it was actually quite easy for them potentially to get those Dyson products back at the end of life, thereby creating that closed loop. So those biopolymers could be captured back and potentially recycled into the next generation of Dyson products. Interesting short feasibility study led to lots of other things. So projects like that in scope for this course. Uh, this is a great big project we, we funded under supply chain innovation towards a circular economy. The, the key thing here was people working together, all the different elements of supply chain. So if you can see those logos in the top left-hand corner, you can see we've got the people that make the polymer. We've got the brands that ultimately source the packaging that that polymer goes into. We've got the people, this was all about flexible pouches. We've got the people that make the base matrix sheets that the, the things are made from. We've got the people that make the inks. We've got the recycling specialists. Reflex was all about how do we make flexible plastic packaging recyclable? How do we create a market for the material we'll recover from pouches at the end of their life? And can we move that material back in, effectively creating a closed loop? The answer is yes, and work continues. Reflex has become a, a, a collaboration called C-Flex, and they continue to work on it. And some really fascinating things came out of that project. Not least, the extent to which the polymer manufacturer, when they started turning their mind to recycling, how much knowledge and experience they had. Uh, Dow were able to, to do some incredible work on improving the compatibilization of recycled polymer with virgin polymer. It's always struck me as unusual and, and a bit of a barrier that there seems to be quite a disconnect between people who recycle plastic and people who make plastic the sort of separation that you don't necessarily see in metals recycling or fiber recycling, where often you have the same companies. So again, funding in this call could facilitate you, a recycler, working with you, a polymer manufacturer, and involve everyone else along the way. And there's all sorts of interesting and exciting things happening. This is brand new, hot off the press. Um, that's a guy called Adam. Adam was one of the winners in our Young Innovators competition. I don't know, is he in the room? No, no, no. good. Um, he's very tall. Met him briefly the other day, he's enormously tall. Adam, working by himself, has created a filter system that you attach to a domestic washing machine specifically to capture microfibers. Brilliant idea, lovely. Design, a product, you know, potentially that technology could be licensed to washing machine manufacturers. That technology could be sold as a standalone bolt-on unit, depending on you know, your willingness to get under the sink with a wrench and 
play around with stuff. I know I would. Anyway, you know, again, interesting design context, technology, different approaches to solving this overall systemic problem. So just going to finish with some projects that uh, we didn't fund, but just some ideas, some of the things that we're thinking about. So new materials. Has anyone seen these? Gumdrop bins? I'm very fortunate. I met Anna, the, 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 the designer, designer who created Gumdrop um, several years ago. And I was blown away. It's insane. Um, it's chewing gum and plastic to make a new material, um, but utilized in quite an interesting way. So she found out, she, dis she discovered that you could combine chewing gum with new polymer, um, quite a strong pink colorant, as you can see, uh, to make a new material. And she thought, what am I gonna do? Oh, I'll make it into chewing gum bins. And then once that gumdrop is full, you close it up, you send it in, and it gets reprocessed into the next generation of gumdrop bins. Obviously, ultimately, that's not sustainable because you would end up with just one giant gumdrop bin the size of the planet. Maybe the fish could live in it. No, but she's branching out now into other products and other markets. So now you're starting to see this material being utilized to uh, make the soles of shoes, very pink soles of shoes. But uh, yeah, whatever. Um, but, you know, those sorts of projects, interesting. It raises awareness, but underneath it, there's a sound and growing business. I don't know. This I just stole this slide from Google. It was credited, but I think the, the picture's zoomed out. You know, packaging concepts. Hopefully, you get the idea. I used to work in plastics recycling, and, and you had a special cold, dark place in your heart for trigger packs. Because trigger packs have metal springs and tiny little metal ball bearings. And they look to a machine, to machine sorting for the most part. They look like uh, just normal PET bottles. So they're merrily sorted. They drop into our very expensive granulators. And those little ball bearings turn into like shotgun pellets. Pow. Smash up your knives. But why? You know, it, go, go across to continental Europe and you'll often see just the bottle. And they expect people to swap over the trigger pack. But this is a different context. So here you would own the bottle and why wouldn't you sort of perhaps make that a little bit nicer the product is delivered in that little clip on thing at the base and then you add water off you go packaging concepts like that reducing the amount of plastic used yes potentially challenges around the recyclability but everything is a balance and, and these are concepts we funded new recycling processes so that is um a, a slightly washed out shot of uh, the RT7000, which is uh, a system that's designed by a Swindon company, if you don't know, innovators in Swindon, called Recycling Technologies, who are in the process of uh, building something quite special up in Scotland. I think it's so or Tim earlier from Zero Waste Scotland. Um, really interesting system, it uses a fluidized bed reactor, and it's able to take all that low grade, hard to sort, difficult to valorize mixed plastic detritus, let's say, once the nice PET and the HDPs were hooked off, sold to recycling companies like where I used to work, what you're left with is a challenge. This is, a, is almost a chemical-based recycling process, converts it into industrial wax, a high-value product. This is, a, this is a company that we've been proud to support over several iterations of this technology, and now they're at, ready for market. So who knows? The next recycling technologies could be sitting in this room. And even at, even at like interventions at the large scale, so um, uh, those of you that know uh, will know, those of you that don't, don't. That's a preform system. So that injection molds, they're little plastic preforms that then get stretch blow molded to make the soft drinks bottles, the water bottles, the, the, the personal care bottles. Um, made by a company called Husky. Uh, and that is the Husky Hypet 6000, something like that, brackets RX. What does the RF stand for? Recycled flakes. So this is a major equipment manufacturer who's innovated and researched and found a way to develop plastics manufacturing systems that are predicated towards the inclusion and use of recycled plastic. So we start to see the acceptance and the implementation and people innovating around recycling plastics at all stages in the supply chain. And last but by no means least, 
you know, even under this uh, competition, we'll be funding potentially innovative, interesting business concepts. This is Splosh. Uh, I'm, a, I'm a Splosh customer, but I'm not sort of formally endorsing them. Um, Splosh is, is a way, again, of, of taking the bulk out of um, uh, shipping around household products, but also intrinsic to the Splosh model is reuse of plastics. They're extending the life of plastics containers. So you get high quality or heavy duty, I should say, um, containers for washing up liquid and floor sprays, and you get concentrates posted to you by the post. Um, cuts down on packaging, reduces the amount of plastic, extends the productive life of the plastic bottles. But even those, the plastic bottles that you use, if you, if you do decide to, to go away from Splosh because you forgot to order the washing up liquid sachets and your family were upset and you got shouted at, you know, even if you choose not to continue with the service, again, you can still pop those things in your recycling bin. But, you know, ideas, collaborations, doing things differently. So that's it from me. Um, I'm going to hand over to my uh, uh, colleagues who are going to tell you exactly how to access the money. You've paid the price. You've listened to me waffle on for 20 minutes. But again, just to finish, the scope of this competition, the aim of this particular competition is, is to support innovation with the potential to deliver circular economy approaches to plastic use. Brackets, looking at Sally, including plastic-based textiles and elastomers, or rubber, for those of you that that, that know. So what does that mean? It, it's a broad scope. I'm sure you'll have picked that up from diligently reading through the entire scope document available on the website. But it might be, you know, you, you could have a project around developing new polymer materials. It could be new product designs, plastic product designs. It could be a new recycling process. It could be all sorts of ways in which you can increase the value of recycled polymer. It could be really hardcore polymer science just working out how to compatibilize recycled PET with virgin PET to reduce black spec or color shift. It could even be something that changes behavior, innovation that ultimately leads to a reduction in plastic waste. But please remember, most importantly, we are Innovate UK. This is business-led innovation. So whatever your project idea is, if it has that opportunity to deliver a more circular approach to plastic, you need as well to be able to demonstrate the potential for growth and productivity. It must be underpinned and led by business. But I'm straying into the, the territory that my colleagues will cover. And again, looking, must describe how will you reduce plastic waste going into the environment? And last, but not explicitly stated on the slide, but we're already getting a few questions and queries in around this particular call. So we want to be clear. Um, we are excluding any approach, any project that relates to the incineration of plastic waste. And by incineration, we do mean throwing it into a thing and burning it. So we've had a number of people asking if sort of they can do stuff with pyrolysis, maybe to convert plastic into liquid fuels or other potential precursors. Those I would judge in scope, but again, you would need to illustrate how they were innovative. All right, at that point, I'm going to... I'm going to stop. I'm going to, I don't know if I'm handing back to Sally. I'm handing directly over to Julie. Julie. So thank you. And, and you know, we're hanging around. There's questions. If you want to talk about project ideas, find collaborators. We'll cover all that later. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. I'm not sure how I can follow that. That was really good. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm uh, Julie Brown, uh, Portfolio Manager at Innovate UK. I'm here with my colleague, Philip. We are just going to talk you through this uh, brief agenda here. We're going to go through the eligibility criteria of the competition. We will then look at the application process, project details, and the application questions. Then I'll hand across to my colleague, uh, Philip, who will go through the finances, which includes the project costs, funding rules. We'll look at the assessment and selection. And then we'll look at the project set up for successful applicants. And then at the very end, we'll have a Q&A session. So should you have any questions, should you have any questions, either on process, finances, or scope, uh, we've got an opportunity there to ask some questions. OK, eligibility criteria. This is all on the guidance documents that are all online. So I'll just quickly go over these. Uh, projects can range between 50,000 to a million and can be three to 24 months in length. 
To lead a project where the project costs are below uh, 100,000, you must be an SME. However, if your project costs are above 100,000, then you can be a UK business of any size or an RTO. The application has 10 uh, questions, so we'll go through that in greater detail shortly. Um, we are allowing appendices, that's for questions two, three, seven, and eight. And if you do have any academics in your consortium, we will require a JES document with a with council status. Okay, this is the types of organization that Innovate UK will fund. Um, so we've got businesses, small, medium, large. The research organizations under that umbrella does fit the universities, are non-profit distributing RTOs, public sector research establishments, and the research council institutes. Okay, participation rules. So at least 70% of the eligible uh, total eligible project costs must be incurred by a business. If you have an academic in your consortium, um, it's limited to 30% of the total project costs. If you do have two academics or more academics, um, that 30% has to be shared between them. So collaboration. Uh, what is collaboration? So at least two organizations claiming grant and at least one SME. A business or RTO consortium must involve both the business and the research base. And there must be evidence of effective collaboration. So you need to explain in your application form how all the parties will contribute to the project and benefit from the collaboration. Okay, making more than one application. So here, any one business may be involved in up to three applications into this competition, but can only be the lead partner in one. Uh, any RTO uh, can be the lead partner in one application, and there must be at least two other businesses, and at least one of those as an SME claiming grant. If they're leading an application, you can be involved up to three in this competition, as it says. Uh, if you're not the lead on an application, you can partner in as many applications as you want. And academics uh, cannot lead on applications, but can be a collaborator in num any number of applications. There's a lot of information, like I said, but all of this is in the guidance and the brief that's online. Okay, key dates. Uh, competition opened 18th of June. We're now doing the briefing event on the 19th. Submission deadline, this is when the competition closes online, and this is a 12 o'clock hard stop deadline, 8th of August, and applicants will be informed whether you're successful or not on the 21st of September. Okay, application process. So we are using the IFS, which is the Innovation Funding Service for this competition. Relatively new, it is digital, it's, it's our digital platform, there's no registration required. It does calculate your eligible grant dependent on the amount, uh, the size of your business and the research that you are conducting, and it will validate your application. So we'll go through this now. Okay. If you go on to innovate.gov.uk, latest um, funding opportunities, click on there, you'll come through to uh, this screen here where it's innovation competitions. You can put in a keyword, so it does have the keyword search facility, so you can put in plastics. It will then go and find uh, the middle slide. Uh, it gives you a brief summary on that competition. Um, and if you are happy and it fits what you want to do, you can go in and there it will have all um, the tabs, which is key dates, information on how to apply. How to apply will have all the questions, so you'll be able to see all the questions there, the criteria, the scope. If you're happy and it is the competition for you, you just press the green button to start application. If you're new with this, you need to create an account on IFS. Very, very easy to do this. You can just go in, you can use Companies House to find the information or just key this in yourself. If you're not new, you just need to re-log in. Okay, uh, once you've logged in, you will get this view. From here, you can set up your consortium and team members. You can invite your colleagues and collaborators to help you with your application by assigning questions to them. The application overview allows you to see details such as the competition title, application, um, deadline, progress bar, and the grants T's and C's. It's very easy. Uh, you can then invite your participants uh, to work with you on the application by entering their name and email address in this field here. Um, IFS will then invite them via email. What we would say is uh, any collaborative partners will be responsible for entering their own project costs. If you do have any academics, um, it should be, they should wait to be invited in. They shouldn't go in and try and make a, an account themselves because they could actually be classed as a business and it causes a lot of issues. 
Okay, um, IFS, uh, when completing your application, you can assign questions to other people in your organization or partner organization. Uh, they can complete and edit the answer. They, they, they can then assign it to someone else to add a little bit more details around it. It just saves us uh, sending around emails and paper as such like. It can all be done all online. Um, they can still edit their answer after marking it as complete. There are some key features which you can see here. So it's got the online guidance which can help you. You can format your answer which is a huge help to assessors because before um, people used to put in their answers and squash everything up so it's quite hard for the assessors to see. Now you can format. It's got a word count to help you and you can spell check using your web browser. This is what the application form looks like. Uh, it has three sections that you will need to complete. So we've got project details, application questions and your finances. So we'll go through the application uh, project details now. Okay. So it has five uh, points to complete. Um, so you've got the application title, and it's amazing how many people forget to put a title in, to be honest. So it, it, is, it is quite key. Uh, estimated time scales, research category. Please do put your uh, correct research category because it does help us. Uh, it will, actually, in actual fact, um, uh, calculate the amount of grant that you're actually eligible for. So it's quite key. Uh, innovation areas on this competition, we have two innovation areas. So select polymers and plastics or sustainable materials. Is your application a submission? Yes or no, we're just collecting those answers. Okay, we have a project summary, public description and scope. These are uh, areas of the application form that are not scored, but are vital. Um, so here for project summary, you need to provide a summary of the project, including its innovation, highlight the need or challenge, approach in innovation and the outcomes. This just sets the scene for the assessors. Public description, here we're asking you to provide a summary of the project again, that you would be happy to be published if your project is successful. Please be aware of confidentiality here. Scope, uh, here you will need to show how your project fits within the scope. It's really important that you are in scope to receive funding. You may have the best innovative project uh, with a comprehensive application, but if you're not in scope, it will not go for uh, assessment. Uh, so therefore, uh, in this area, please do give the assessors plenty of detail in how your project fits. Right, application questions. This is what the uh, 10 questions uh, look like. Uh, we're allowing appendices, like we said, for questions two, three, seven, and eight. There's a lot of information on the next slides, so my I'll only read out a few of the bullet points. My suggestion would be heavily to go online, have a look, um, and you can, and obviously this has been recorded, so you can watch this at a later date. Have a look at the questions. So question one is need or challenge. So what is the drive and reason for doing the project? Is your project market pull or technology push? We want to see there's a genuine need for your idea. So here we're asking you to describe the main motivation for the project, the business need, technological challenge or market opportunity. Question two is all around approach and innovation. What approach will you take and where will the focus of the innovation be? So here we're asking you to describe what you're doing in your project and how it is an improvement on what already exists. Explain how it will improve on the nearest current state of the art identified. I indicate where the focus of the innovation will be in the project. So it is an application of existing technologies in new areas um, or development of new technologies um, or a totally disruptive approach. Question three is all around team and resources. So who is in the project team and what are their roles? So here we want you to describe um, why you and any partners are the right people to do the job. Assessors will be looking to see that you have the right skills, experience and access to facilities. Who's involved in what role and why have you chosen them? Question four is market awareness. What does the market you are targeting look like? How well do you understand the market you'll be operating in? Uh, specify the market and uh, what market you'll be targeting in the project and any other potential markets. Question five is outcomes and route to market. What is the impact your project will have on the business and the consortium? Describe your current position in the market again um, and any supply value chains outlined. Will you be extending or establishing your market position? 
describe your target customers or end users and the value proposition to them. Why would they use it or buy it? Question six is wider impacts. So here we're asking you to describe um, the wider impacts of your project outside your project team. Uh, identify and where possible quantify the economic benefits from the project to those outside the project. So that be customers, others in the supply chain, broad industry and the UK economy, such as productivity increases and import substitution. Here we'd like you to identify any expected social impacts, either positive or negative, for example, on the quality of life, social uh, inclusion, exclusion and jobs, be they safeguarded, created or changed or displaced. Question seven is project management. Assessors are looking to see that you have a well thought out project plan. So we'd like you to outline the main work packages of the project, indicating the relevant research category and the lead partner assigned to each and the total cost of each one. Describe your approach to project management and identify any key tools and mechanisms that will be used to ensure successful project delivery and highlighting your approach to managing the most innovative aspects of the project. Eight, question eight, risks. Um, we know that innovation projects or innovative projects, I should say, are risky. It's what we're here to fund. So here we're asking you to identify the key risks and uncertainties of the project, including the technical, commercial, managerial, environmental risk, highlighting the most significant ones. Uh, explain how these risks will be um, mitigated. Question nine is around additionality. Tell us the difference the public funding from Innovate UK would make to your project, such as faster route to market, more partners, reduced risk. What is the likely impact of the project on the business of the partners involved? Tell us why you are not able to wholly fund the project from your own resources or any other forms of private sector funding. What would happen if your innovation or your application was not successful? Question 10, costs and value for money. Assessors are looking to see that the project is reasonable and good value for money. So here we want you to explain the partners uh, and how they will finance their contribution to the project. How the project represents value for money for you and the taxpayer. How does it compare to what you would spend your money on otherwise? If you do have any subcontracting costs in your application, you need to explain why they're critical to the outcome of the project. Again, I said that that is a lot of um, words. Um, please do go on to the guidance that's online and you can go on uh, and have a look at all those questions in a little bit more detail. I'm going to hand across to Philip now, who's going to go through the application finances. Thank you. Thank you very much, Julie. I'm Philip Adder. I'm the portfolio manager for this competition. I'm just going to be going through the second half of our operational slides with you. Starting with application finances. So at the bottom, under the Your Finances tab, there are three sections to complete. Each organization is responsible for completing their own finances, and all sections for each partner must be marked as complete before you can submit your application. The sections will vary dependent upon whether you're a business or an academic. The screenshot behind me is for a business, and we'll be going through academic costs shortly. First, I'll go through your project costs. So any organization not completing a JES form, so everyone but the academics, will need to complete their project costs using this form. There are seven eligible cost categories that each organization needs to complete. Uh, we're now going to go through each of these in detail. IFS works on the basis that you enter your detailed costs and their values will be calculated and validated by the service. Project cost guidance is available online. Please familiarize yourself with this before making your application. The first section is labor costs. So this is the staff working directly on the project. For this, please enter the position, the salary, the number of staff, and the days to be spent on the project. The rate and the total cost will then be auto-calculated on the service. The number of days needs to reflect the total number for all staff in that role. So for example, for the second roll down, if you can make it out, there is two engineers, so therefore their number of days is expected to be higher. 
You may adjust the working days per year from the default if this is different for your organization. If you have multiple people in the same role, as I say, please mark it in the first column. We define overheads at Innovate UK as additional costs and operational expenses incurred directly as a result of the project. These could include additional costs for administrative staff, general IT, rent, and utilities. You can select from three options that you can see on the screen as to which way you'd like your overheads calculated. If you choose to calculate the overhead yourself, you'll be taken to the following screen. Now this is a bit of a small screenshot in the corner, so I'll say that it's a download to a file where you'd fill in your overhead yourself. And these are split into indirect and direct overheads. So we class indirect overheads as those costs kind of associate with your back office functions, so your finance, your HR, and your kind of general admin, whose primary function is to support the running of a business enterprise. They can only claim a portion of their time and their work needs to be additional to what has already been used for the delivery of the project and not support they provide as part of their business as usual. Typically, these costs are not directly related to a particular product or service production. Direct overheads is more cost related to the staff actually working on the project. So this is laptops, uh, workstations, those sort of costs. And for this, we've just provided a form so that you can state the costs and categorize them yourself in just a list. Uh, so please provide breakdowns and as much detail as you can for kind of justifying these costs so our project finance executives can kind of know that they are justified for the project. So materials, uh, you can claim the cost of materials on your project. Uh, enter the, and describe what materials you intend to use on the project. Uh, and this has to be materials directly for the project and not used anywhere else in your business as usual. If these materials are supplied by associate companies or parent companies, then these materials must be supplied at cost with no profit margins or profit elements included. For capital equipment usage, uh, here you'll need to describe how you're using the equipment, whether it's new or existing, the new purchase cost, and how long you are depreciating it over, as, long, as well as the residual value at the end of the project. These calculations need to be in line with your accounting practices, so if you've got any doubts, please be in contact with your accountants to verify how you should depreciate these items. For subcontractor costs, if this is going to be a significant amount, then you'll need to justify who, why, and what you need them for, both here and in the text of your application. That second point is key because the assessors will only see kind of a top view of your application finances. So if they see a large subcontractor cost, it's important that actually in the text of your application is justified and explained for them. If you use a parent company for this, similar to for with materials, this will need to be provided at cost with no profit element. So for travel and subsistence, here you include things such as any essential meetings for the project and anything that needs to happen during the project for travel. You cannot include any sales and marketing activity since this is an ineligible cost. For this, if you feel that the cost of your trip is slightly more significant, it may be worth giving as much detail as you can, including perhaps mode of transport and starting and destination points. These are just details that will help project finance executives to see that the cost is justified towards your project. Other costs, uh, as the name suggests, is any costs that don't fit within the first six categories. Um, so please check the finance guidance for the full list of what can be included here. But some examples of costs that would be deemed other is training directly attributable to the project, preparation of technical reports, patent filing costs, and this is restricted to £7,500 and only for SME partners, 
and regulatory and compliance costs. So after you've completed your project costs, the next, uh, the next one down on the list is your organization. You can see on the screen behind me the information we ask you to provide. Your organization size determines the grant funding percentage your organization is eligible to receive. And the other information we ask for, such as the financial overview, and the number of full-time employees, will help with our financial viability checks if your application is successful. If you're a recent startup company who hasn't yet had a financial year, you can input zeros onto this form. If your application is successful, you will need to make sure you are registered with Companies House before you're eligible to get any funding from us. I'm now gonna take a quick sidestep and talk about the process for academic partners claiming funds. So as people who have applied to us before will hopefully know, we use the JES system for academic costs. This is a good, good system run by the research councils and makes it very easy for research councils to co-fund if they're doing so in a specific competition. The form validates costs for us and Innovate UK does not have access to the JES system to, to extract the information ourselves, which is why you will need to send this information to us. So the view on IFS for an academic is slightly simpler than it is for a business. There is just one category called your project costs, which you'll still need to complete. On this uh, screenshot behind me, you'll see the view for an academic. At the top, you need to put in your reference number from a JES form. Now, before you complete this section, your JES form needs to have the status with council, as my colleague Julie explained, and it cannot be submitted before this. And you also might need to make sure that the figures in your JES form match what you enter into IFS. This must be identical. You must ensure also that academic partners complete the justification of resources and pathways to impact sections on the JES form, as this is information that the assessors will look for. Any questions on JES, then please call or email the JES help desk. The details are on the slide behind me. They are a lot more better equipped to help you than we are, because like I say, this is run by the research councils and they are experts at this. If you're a partner in a project, but you do not want to claim any grant, that's absolutely fine. We would still require you to enter your project costs onto IFS, so we know that what you're contributing to the project. So if a partner wishes to collaborate, but does not wish to claim grant, the lead will invite the partner, as described by my colleague Julie, and the partner must select not requesting funding. The partner will then have to fill out their project costs, and that is it. Now to step back to a business that is claiming funding. There we go. We've been through the top two sections on your project costs and your organization, and the final one left is just your funding. So as previously mentioned, the level of funding awarded will be dependent upon the type of organization, and the type of research being undertaken in the project. IFS will calculate your grant percentage based on the answers inputted. And just to give a very clear view of this, we've got a nice table on the slide behind me with the different grant rates for different company sizes based on the type of project you are undertaking. So please be sure to correctly classify your project and your business size for this reason. So as well as part of IFS, there is no longer a conditional offer letter with this new process, as those who have applied to us in the past may remember, which is why it's important that each organization acknowledges and accepts the standard grant terms and conditions before the application is submitted, as this replaces the conditional offer letter. Your funding will ask you to confirm the percentage of grant that you require, whilst IFS will tell you the maximum you are eligible to receive, some partners may choose to claim less than this. Some competitions limit the level a business may receive to 50% to comply with treasury funding requirements, and this is why IFS will re 
prompt you to say which funding percentage you would like. On this screen as well, there is a section other funding where you need to declare if you're receiving any other public funding towards this project, as this would need to be uh, subtracted from the amount of grant you're eligible to receive due to state aid rules. So you've completed the questions and the finances and you're ready to submit your application. Behind me on the screen is a summary of the project costs and this is available to all organizations in the project. You can only view the details of your own organization's finances. This is also the view that the assessors will see, which is why I emphasize that if there's any large costs, you may want to bring them up in the text of your application so that they know they're justified. IFS will check all organizations have marked their finances complete, and they will also ensure that, no re that research organization participation is no greater than the 30% allowed for this competition. Please be aware that IFS validates your application and all finances must be correct and signed off before the lead applicant can submit the application. Similarly, all the application questions, the 10 questions and the project summary and those details must have the green complete check mark next to them. You can't really see on the screen here but you can see that a few of them have red marks and that's because they're still marked as incomplete. You do need to make sure that these are all green and marked as complete. And please leave plenty of time to make your submission as well, because if there is an issue like this on submission day, then we'd hate for you to miss the deadline. So kind of on this note, we see a lot of applicants who complete an application, but don't complete the final step. So please ensure you click submit application. You'll get a screen like this to make sure you're sure that you want to submit the application. And once you submit, that is it. You can go back and view the application, but you can no longer edit. The view you will then get looks like this. So as you can see, application submitted. The lead participant only will receive a notification email to confirm that the application has been submitted. And the details at the bottom of that screenshot is IFS telling you what will happen next. So there was a screenshot here, but I think it disappeared in the translate over. Whoops. So anyway, what this graph was basically showing, I'll just paint a word picture, I guess, is in the hours running up to a competition close, the number of applications we receive through IFS increases hour on hour up to the noon deadline. Uh, the point of this was to emphasize, don't leave submission to the last minute. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Nick. Uh, it kind of looks like this. But the main point that we're trying to emphasize with it, thank you very much, is that on submission day, our customer support services will be very busy taking calls from last minute applicants. And if you leave it to the last minute, we'd hate for you to not fill in a question correctly, or we've had people copy and paste into the wrong question and submit. And after you submit, there is nothing we can do to help you. So please leave yourself plenty of time. After you've submitted on your dashboard, as you can see from the lower, it says application in progress, awaiting assessment, application submitted, so you're all good. It's all sorted, you just need to wait till the competition closes. So applications, uh, application assessment. All applications are assessed by independent assessors drawn from industry and academia. From reading lines and lines of assessor feedback, we hear again and again the kind of things they're looking for, which is clarity, detail, justification, and that the applicant has presented a viable opportunity for growth. As far as our Innovate UK process goes, once the competition closes, we will look through the applications to make sure they're in scope. If we deem them in scope, they'll be sent, then sent to five independent assessors. They will then score the applications and send their scores back to us, which we will combine, and that will be the score that your application gets. 
assess the feedback. The lead will be notified when this becomes available, and this will be available through the IFS dashboard, and you'll be able to view the exact feedback that the, app, that the assessors have had about your application. I'm now going to spend a bit of time talking about project setup for if your application is successful. So we've changed the product setup process to make it more simple for users. As I've said previously, we no longer issue a conditional offer letter after notification. So that kind of saves some time and saves us a piece of paperwork. Therefore, the setup process is simply just checking your costs. We'll assign you a monitoring officer. You will need to input your bank details. And the important part is you'll need to get your collaboration agreement if you're working with other people. You'll need to get that sorted and also upload an exploitation plan onto our system before you're able to start. So the seven steps then between, I guess, being successful and being starting your, starting your project, sorry, is project details. When you receive the notification that you're successful, please log into IFS and prompt your partners to do the same, since we will need the lead to nominate the project manager and a finance contact. The lead will also confirm the project location and the start date of the project. Collaborating partners will also need to log in because they'll need to give us a finance contact in order to contact them with any queries we might have. Innovate UK will assign you a monitoring officer who'll be in charge of monitoring your pro project. And all partners, lead, all partners will need to go in and give us their UK bank account details so that we can verify them ahead of the project starting. This is an important step. Innovate UK will then conduct their financial reviews and all partner finances. Finance contacts at this point may be asked for additional supporting information if there are any queries. All partners, uh, after the bank details have been verified and the finances verified, all partners will then complete a spend profile, profiling their approved project costs for the life of the project. And then it's the project manager needs to upload a signed collaboration agreement signed by all partners and an exploitation plan. Once these six prerequisite steps are complete, Innovate UK will be able to release a grant offer letter, which will be signed by the lead organization on behalf of all the partners. I'm now just going to go through a few of the steps in a bit more detail to give a bit more clarity. So step four, which is our finance reviews. Our project finance team will conduct finance checks on each partner. So for the applicant, there are the viability checks. And this is to ensure that the company legally exists and to assess whether it can meet its financial obligations for the project. So for example, a small or micro company will only receive 70% of their eligible costs. We'll just need to get some assurances that either through private funding or money in the bank, you can fill that other 30%. We'll also do project cost eligibility checks to make sure costs meet our eligibility and state aid criteria and that they also follow the competition rules, although I don't think there's anything specific about this competition that will change that. And this also involves reviewing partner project cost to check that they also meet the published eligibility criteria. The sixth step is another important one since this is the collaboration agreement. And so this is an original agreement signed by all participants in the project. And the key features that we'll need to cover is who is in the consortium, what are the aims, and how is the work divided up? Ownership of IP is always a big point for these documents and management of the consortium. Now we bring this up now because negotiating a collaboration agreement is complicated and it can be time consuming. So we want you to get you thinking about that now. Ideally, you will have started work on it before you even submit your application. And then the grant offer letter so after those prereq six prerequisite steps are all done, the grant offer letter will be released. The lead applicant will have to sign and return it, although it's important that obviously all partners have read it and agree to it. And then once it is returned, your project can begin. So that's good. Um, now some words, so a slide on grant claims and payments. An important point, especially for a smaller company, is that all grants are claimable in arrears. So therefore, you must be able to fund the first quarter of your project 
and then you'll be able to make your first claim and you'll be able to get some of that money back. Um, so if you're a small organization, be wise to manage your cash flow and we'd hate for you to get caught out, especially since significant costs can occur up front in projects. Uh, claims are only paid once our necessary reporting and auditing is done as well. So please work with your monitoring officer to get that all complete. And happily, that brings me to the end of my slides. I hope you've enjoyed. And now we're going to have the Q&A. So any questions you have on process, scope, the application questions, I believe we're going to have some roving mics. Can I just say thank you to both the speakers first, please? Thanks. Three speakers. OK, we've got three ways to field a question. There's two people in the room with roving, roving mics, and there's also AJ Capadia, who's fielding questions from the WebEx, who has his hand up. So we'll take the first question from AJ. OK, thank you. Uh, is there any field, uh, example, medical, agriculture, packaging, considered more relevant for this particular funding uh, and for the overall UK strategy on plastics? So uh, the question, if there's any particular field or sector that we're highlighting, uh, the answer for, for this competition is no. Um, if it's polymer or, or polymer related, it could be packaging, could be medical, could be agricultural use, could even conceivably be automotive sector, construction sector, plastics, uh, for this particular call. Um, there isn't a, um, a, a UK RI wide approach or again, highlight sectors for the, the, the industrial strategy challenge fund bid to which I was referring to, but uh, in part that's because that program is still under development. So okay, I hope that covers it. That's fine. Would this competition consider projects aiming to develop new cost-effective devices to collect macroplastic waste from rivers and oceans? Uh, yes, I would say that that would fall in scope. Uh, again, uh, providing you were able to demonstrate that it was a, a you know a viable commercial proposition, or there was a viable commercial proposition in the future of that piece of work. So the questions as as my colleagues indicated, you know, what's the financial viability? What's the route to market? But yes. Uh, we have a question in the room. Uh -huh. Familiar face. Hello, Rob. Hello, Nick. Uh, I'm Chris Schoen from a consultancy called Reboot Innovation. Yeah. Um, my question is about subcontractors, subcontracting. Yeah. Um, and uh, so if you're working with a design consultancy or with an LCA um, yeah. specialist, they're likely to be consultants and want to come in as subcontractors. So my, uh, actually two questions. So one is, um, is there a maximum amount that you can subcontract in a project? And the second one is, could, could will subcontractors be considered to be part of a consortium or are they outside of, the, of, of a consortium? Do you want to take on Julie? <laughs> There, there is no subcontracting cost um, limit as such, but you would have to justify why you're using them and if it's substantial, um, why it is substantial. So the assessors would need to see a really good explanation. Um, if you are subcontracting, they will not be included in the collaboration agreement because it would be considered outside of the consortium as such. That's just work that you're bringing in. So they won't be mentioned in the, con in the um, collaboration agreement. If you're subcontracting. And if you... If you need two partners, would a subcontractor be considered a project partner or not a project partner? Not a project partner, no. Thank you. You can, now, there's a good question. Can you subcontract on a less than 12 months, less than 100K as an individual SME? Subcontracting is still a valid cost. So if you were below the, you know, if you were in the single entity project, then you could subcontract but that would have the, the cap on the project value and duration. Any more? Oh, I see more, more, more. Um, I got a question regarding scope, actually. My name is Junius Dear, Cardiff University. Um, in particular, would mixed materials be in scope? So if you were looking for a recovery process, 
that uses plastics, but also perhaps incorporates paper. So creating a, 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 a some kind of composite product that included both well, plastics or, and paper or? Um, our proposal isn't, is to look at a, an alternative reductant and the paper would be a component in that, uh, that, that material is an alternative reductant. Okay, is that, apologies to people, would, would I have seen something about that at the Steel and Metals Institute launch? Is that uh, similar? I don't think so. In Swansea? For, is it for use in steel? It is, yeah, yeah. Okay, so. Uh, but yeah, I and make an I'm uh, happy to talk in more detail offline. Uh, you know, if, if it's about adding value, creating value for plastic, um, and there are other materials involved, Yes, I would say that would be in scope. But uh, reiterate the thing about approaches where you're just burning and not in scope, which I appreciate that that, you know, based on my understanding of, of, of what that initiative is about, if I've understood correctly and I'm thinking about the right thing, I appreciate that that's not straight incineration, that there's, there's, a, there's a higher purpose, if you like, to it. Yeah. So I would say probably. <laughs> but if we talk more, I will okay. give you a definitive answer. Right, thanks. There we go. Thank you. Um, uh, two questions, if I may. Uh, so the first one is around uh, the research category. And can projects be split over feasibility, industrial research, and environmental development? Yes. Um, and there's an equation that you use to calculate depending on how much is in which category. Okay. And there's advice. Uh, yeah, it's, it's in the guidance. It's all stated in the guidance. So if, if, you, if you do want to split it across or you just pick the area where the most innovation is and choose that area. OK, great. Thank you. And then the second one was four million pounds is a fantastic amount of money. Uh, there's a lot of people in the room who want to slice that four million pounds. Um, and there are other grant funds available. Would, would it be frowned upon if we think we're eligible for this one, but actually another one which might we might equally think we're strong enough for? If we were to apply for both, obviously only claim for one if we were successful in both. Yes, yeah, you, you know, nice. you can apply for both. Um, you, you get funded for one. Yeah, you can't, you can't, you can't, um, you can't be paid to do the same piece of work from two yeah. separate calls. Yeah. Um, it is very occasionally we think we find people doing that. Yes. Very occasionally, yeah. um, but also you as an individual company as well there are ceilings on how much state aid you can receive as a proportions of turnover so we would expect you to be on top of all of that yeah yeah absolutely thank you okay uh does plastic include styrofoam type materials uh, uh by styrofoam expanded polystyrene yes plastic yep Nice to get simple questions. Hi, uh, Ed Bell King from Shamber Services. Our uh, project is outside UK jurisdiction. It's actually in Tanzania. Um, and so there's, there's, there's two parts to it. One is a business model innovation, which is crypto tokens to pay people to collect plastic. And the other part is, um, in terms of the funding model, we're raising our money through crypto. Um, we'll have the keys for that. So is that proof enough for you that we have those funds? So that's got to be a first for the finance team. <laughs> As an innovation agency, we clearly know everything there is to know about Bitcoin. We might want to refer that one to a specialised... I, I don't know, that's a really tough question. It, it is, and, and I, I don't know the answer, I'm afraid. What I would say, if anyone, oh, even uh, outside of this uh, meeting, if you do have any questions, please do go through to the customer services support department. They are very, very good. They will uh, uh, send a question to myself, to the finance team, or to Nick and we'll make sure we get, we get you a comprehensive answer. Then we'll ask a couple of our industrial mathematicians <laughs> to work that one out. But with regard to the, the question about um, the market, we, we will fund UK-registered, UK-based UK entities. Um, it is a global market. You know, if the market opportunity is overseas, but you can show where growth and productivity will come for UK-registered businesses, UK-registered SMEs, then I... I, I think that you would be in scope. We can't fund overseas partners, um, but overseas partners can participate as non-funded. And I think under certain circumstances, you can potentially play overseas subcontractors. Um, but usually, again, we'd want to understand 
why that work was being done outside of the UK. We do, have, we do have occasionally international collaborative competitions. I'm not aware of any that are live at the moment. But uh, you know, again, if you're substantially doing the work in the UK, great. If the market opportunity or the target markets are overseas, that's just fine. Just to be clear, that the actual R&D is in the UK. Yeah, then the, actual, the, the opportunity in terms of the, the yeah. actual business model and the innovation, yeah. and, and if you like, the, the method of actually get incentivizing people to collect waste in Africa yeah. is in Africa, yeah. obviously. Then, you know, again, and particularly a few words about how it could be applied in the UK as well, if that is a possibility. Unlikely, I would say, but you never know. But the other markets, but yeah, global market opportunity as well. Okay, um, so another scope question. Can an alternative material considered to replace uh, the plastic be considered for this competition? Pardon me? Yes, so new material development is considered in scope. Um, and if it was particularly would need to demonstrate how it would lead to a reduction potentially in plastic waste, persistent plastic waste in the environment. Oh, okay, another one quick one. Yeah. Can we develop a polymer plastic for medical applications? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> uh, here you go, Tim Baldwin from Zero Waste Scotland. Um, could you just give some clarification on match funding and whether it's got to be or private, or could be in kind, or or just just to clarify that, could be joint funds and from everyone. Um, I mean, a variety of potential it sources. Can, yes, it can, but as, as long as it's you know justified and um, you you put in your application how or where the fund is coming from, absolutely. In kind, we don't like to refer to it as in kind. Um, it is it is another business contributing. Um, you need to put a monetary value on that. So whatever they are contributing, be it whether time or equipment, you need to put a value of that time and equipment and put it into the application form. So that will be eligible? Yes. yes. Thank you. As long as there is, like I say, caveat, the lead has to claim grant. So that the, the lead has to claim grant. And if, if you are an RTO, it has to have to be two grant claiming businesses, one an SME. So all, all the different eligibility requirements around that, but it's all in the guidance. And of course, you know, everything has to be audited first quarter and end of project. So you're independent accountant will need to sign off that everything balanced out. Hello, I'm Fernanda from Lou Watt. Uh, my question is about whether pyrolysis or chemical recycling that involves heat, uh, like melting or some sort of heat, but it's not incineration, is in scope. Yes. Just don't want to see people burning it willy-nilly. Back to the web X, and then well, we have another one in the room. Well, this is this one. This is one from me, actually. So, um, fiber reinforced plastics uh, composites. By uh, in other words, are they in scope? Uh, so, again, uh, as long as the, the they contain polymers, I would argue yes. No, oh, I I don't have to argue. It's my competition. So, um, <laughs> it's not it's UKRI's competition. Um, yes, in fact, I, I I fielded a similar question earlier today. You know, if you were developing polymer-based resins for use in, 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 in composite products, I'd say that would be in scope. If you were developing a recycling process that sought to recover the plastic component or the polymer components of um, composite fibers, yes. If you were burning off the plastic to recover the carbon fibers, there you've probably strayed into no. Um. Good morning, Fabian Watlet for JLR. Um, the assessor's feedback, is it made available to all project partners or only to lead partners? I don't know. <laughs> it is, um, the lead has access to it and it's up for the lead to disseminate it through the uh, consortium. And it will be the scores and the written feedback for each of the questions. Okay. And the second question is, how long does it take between the uh, notification to successful applicants and the start um, of a project? What we would like, it's 90 days, 
uh, 90 days, but uh, because we're, we're not using collaboration ag agreement letter anymore, we've got 30 days to set up that project set up. So they're doing those seven steps, providing all those details that Philip went through. We'd essentially like, and it can happen, it can, if, if you're on the ball and, and you go through it, it should only take 30 days, but you have uh, 90 days to actually start the project, otherwise the funding could be withdrawn. Thank you. Hi, I'm uh, Natalia from the London Waste and Recycling Board. Just to clarify on the scope, on what materials are uh, eligible, uh, you said as long as there is a polymer fraction to it, but we had a question about materials substituting the need for plastics. Just to be clear that if there's another bio-based material that has no polymer uh, ingredients to it, could be within scope. Yes, conceivable. I mean, most biomaterials are polymers, to be blunt. They're, they're cellulosic they're and so on and so forth. It's is it? Yeah, I, uh, yeah. Again, it, it's it wouldn't be an oil extract. It would be uh, fibers from plants and completely other range of not the typical polymer uh, ingredients we. I tell you what. Find right? me afterwards yes. okay, and perfect. explain a little bit more. Just to be clear. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. So we're keeping really well to time. I think we have time for one more question. Anything off the WebEx, AJ? No, nope. anyone else in the room? Okay, uh, thank you very much for all your questions and to the three speakers. I'm just gonna finally finish up with some KTN stuff. And everyone's available over lunch, hopefully. Are you all staying over lunch? Then you can quiz them with any specifics that you have. Okay. Oh no. I think I prefer the handhold thing. <laughs> or Britney Spears with a earpiece, that'd be great. Um, so uh, the Knowledge Transfer Network who's holding this event, uh, uh, just to show you who we are and, and how we sit, Bayes Fund UK Research and Innovation, who uh, Nick uh, spoke about this morning, uh, and they also obviously Innovate UK is part of that research, UK research and organisation. Uh, and the KT and the Knowledge Transfer Network are essentially mostly fully funded by Innovate UK, but we are um, a limited company, and so we can give sort of advice, a little bit more advice in a freer way, in an independent way than we might do if we were uh, within the, the UK or our council ourselves. So we're free to use. You can use any, anyone in this room who's going to apply for a project. You can use myself, Brian. Do you mind putting your hand up, Brian, or those who been roving with the mic? AJ at the back. And there are actually 180 of us in total. There's only three of us in the room. So there's lots of different people who do what we do within the KTN uh, and different sectors and areas of expertise. So we have a water expert, and I can imagine some of the projects around the room might, or into this call might be, have a water aspect to them. Um, we make lots of connections. We have a lot of staff, and uh, we hold events like this. I just show you how we work. Um, we try to understand the whole of the innovation landscape. So uh, we work closely with a, a lot of other people uh, with, within what we call the um, A, the innovation landscape and also the, uh, the, the Innovate UK family. So there's uh, an entity called the European Enterprise Network. We work closely with them for the materials team. That's a guy called Andy Hebb who's based out at the University of Greenwich. So this is if you want to get European contacts and collaborations. Now I'm sort of talking quite widely outside of the scope of this very specific event, but you might be that your project does fit into another call that was brought up by a chap in the middle there that was speaking. You might want to import this uh, application into another call as well. We work with uh, close uh, to uh, the Institute of Materials, Minerals and Mining, uh, lots of the other organizations such as MPL, I know MPL are in the room. So we, we look across the whole of the innovation landscape at the national, regional and, and international organizations. Um, we have lots of contacts within universities. Uh, we work closely with the catapults. Basically, if you want to talk about your project um, and find the right partners to undertake it so that you get the best chance of success for your project, it's probably worth talking to someone within the KTN. Um, we also have contacts within uh, Bayes and uh, internationally as well. So I'm trying to make connections with um, the American Chemistry Council on this issue because obviously America and other countries in the world have a lot of issues similar to us with respect to zero plastic waste. I just want to say there's also just been published by the KTN a good application guide. So in terms of what's been gone through by the Innovate UK team, uh, we've also sort of written down <laughs> from our experience, our sort of combined experience within the KTN, 
how to write an application to make it really successful. That'll tell you um, about accessing uh, collaborative uh, competitions, how to apply, finding collaborative partners. Uh, and most of the staff within uh, KTN have worked on competitions before, so they, ha they have a similar sort of profile and we can help you apply. There's a link to the guide there for anyone on the WebEx. You can go straight and have a look at it now and those in the room a little bit later. There is another fund at the moment called the Open Programme. It's also an Innovate UK fund, which I guess have very, very similar application process to the ones that have just been described by Julian Phillip. Uh, and actually any project in this room that's applicable for the Plastics Innovation Fund would also be applicable for this fund. So you might want to start thinking strategically and tactically about where to put your, uh, your project for best chance of success and, and talk to the KTN there. So just very briefly, that has to be led by a UK business or research organisation, uh, exploiting and carrying out your projects in the UK. Um, <clears throat> you can work alone or in collaboration with others. Um, and it's open now and closes on the 11th of July. And we do know that there will be a round two, which I think will open on the 12th of July. So, <laughs> so if you miss this competition, uh, which closes on the 11th of July, you could apply to the, uh, the second one, round two. And, and, and I've just put up this tree here that's <laughs> a little bit upset because all this family got cut down to make paper, paper cups because it doesn't have to all be about plastics. It, you could look at different materials and, and this will go into the other funding competition. Just to note, there's a maximum of three applications per applicant for this open program funding call. So just be careful which universities you're working with and, and how many applications they may have put in. Something else that's important is innovation loans. Uh, Innovate UK are running a pilot program and, and probably grabbing these guys again over lunch to find a bit more detail about this is your best bet. But it's a way to be um, uh, to sort of take out a loan over a long period, say 10 years, whereas you can uh, get an agreement over the amount of money that you want to borrow. You can draw down on it for, I think it's three years. You're going to tell me it's four. Is it three or four? Uh, there's a, a period, a sort of fallow period when you just pay the interest back where you can uh, get the results of your uh, project funds uh, to market and start getting a profit and then you pay back in the last three year period. So I think three, three and three doesn't add up to 10. So one of those is a four year slot. So uh, KTN and Innovate UK aren't financial advisors. So do have a talk to your uh, financial advisor about this, but it's a low rate loan. It's 3.7%. You could get uh, a million pounds uh, funding there between 100,000 and a million pounds. Another thing that's very important for or very useful for businesses is the KTP scheme. So that's a knowledge transfer partnership where you can use um, expertise within a university in terms of a, a project supervisor and a graduate from university to work on your project. And they're funded to about the level of 50%, depending on the size of your company. And they, they often end up in the, the KTP uh, uh, graduate being employed in the company. So if you're a business, it's something to look at. Something I know even less of, but I think might be important coming in through in the future is the UK Research and Innovation Strength in Places Fund. So beginning to look at sort of critical mass of where expertise or sectors are that have um, knowledge in a particular geographical area. I mean, from my experience, although I don't have the data and I probably need to look at it, I find there's a lot of recycling companies in the northwest region. And I wonder whether that's because there's been expertise in that area with people like ICI in the past in terms of chemistry and polymers. Um, and if there is a critical mass in that area, it's possible those businesses could get together to look at a strength in places in a particular sector to apply for some larger funding. At the moment, it's open for an expression of interest and £50,000 C-Cord funding would have let businesses in, in that area, let's say it's that area and that, that topic, uh, working with their local enterprise partnerships, etc., cetera, to, um, to try to d develop and drive bigger funding into that area. And that, I think, is between 10 and 50 million in total if, if you're successful. So have a look at that if you're looking more strategically. Just to bring up a couple of other things I've noticed in this actual space where we're talking today, EPSRC have got an event for academics tackling the challenges of plastic waste. It's an event on the 12th of June. So I think that's looking towards getting expressions of interest into their call. I haven't got... It says the 12th on the website. Yeah. 
Okay, just ignore my eyesight. Yeah, okay. But the, what this is leading to is that there is a call from the EPSRC, which was opened yesterday. It's an £8 million fund, and it actually has almost the same scope that Innovate UK scope has, uh, and it's for universities to come together to tackle the same issue that Nick talked about uh, and Innovate UK are currently funding. So uh, if you want to go to that uh, website at the bottom, the URL's there, and that that will give you some more information on that fund. There's, yeah, £8 million in that, as I said. Finally, I can see a lot of new faces in the room, which is absolutely brilliant for the KTN, and a lot of people... Can I just actually ask, who's applied for Innovate UK funding before? Oh, quite a lot. But a lot of new faces to me. So <laughs> what I was thinking is that quite a lot of people say to me, oh, what's in it for us? Will we get the funding? Is it really difficult? Oh, we'll not get any. But actually, I just wanted to show you something um, that's really useful every time I go to a company and I mention this. Uh, there's a, a, a sort of fairly new, it's in a beta form, Innovate UK, have let uh, people look at the data of where all the funding's been allocated. It's dataviz.innovateuk.gov.uk forward slash app um, and you can look geographically at all the companies around you that have been funded it gives you a list and little public description as was mentioned by Julie and Philip um, and this is really interesting as it actually shows you the people on your doorstep have had funding before and it helps you understand that actually company size isn't particularly relevant um, and and it just you know I think it really helps people to see that it's possible to get funding so don't think don't apply and I can't get it um, people from all different uh, backgrounds and um, size of company have had funding. So please use the materials team at the KTN. There's myself. Uh, I'm the polymers person. We've got AJ, who's composites. Uh, Brian, who's textiles. We've got a lady called Tatiana, who's not here, who's into graphene. And uh, our, uh, our boss, Robert, who's into metals. So we help you find partners and funding. Um, if you communicate your ideas, we can help you with the project. Uh, and sharing and collaborating, uh, I, I've found, and in, in my experience, has actually led to bigger wins than just working on your own. So don't think it can't be you. Okay. Uh, I think now it's time to hand over to Brian, who wants to launch something new that the KTN are bringing out just today, which is obviously relevant to this sector. So here you go, Brian. So I've got two slides, so I'll take you just a couple of minutes to cover this. Um, we have been working for the last two or three years with the UK packaging sector, and clearly the packaging sector is a major user of plastics. And we thought today marks the launch of a, uh, a packaging report. It's been published by the KTN. It covers the UK packaging sector. And it's basically a landscape study, but it also touches upon a bit of road mapping as well. So there's a bit of sort of future gazing. Um, I was quite intrigued. We've had, I think, three or four, possibly five events over the last two to three years on uh, packaging. Uh, and it tends to deal with food waste. We've looked at smart materials. We've lo looked at smart technologies being embedded into packaging materials. And there's a number of technologies that will interface in that particular sector. Um, but what I thought would be very useful is just to give you a couple of statistics. So the UK packaging manufacturing industry, the sales of 11 billion pounds, employs some 85,000 people, and represents about 3% of UK manufacturing workforce. It's a vital contributor to the UK's GDP, and it links into the broader packaging supply chain. I won't go on, but I will highlight that its productivity is exceptionally high compared to related sectors. And it covers a typical packaging product life cycle, would start with design and innovation, uh, progress through raw material selection, production, manufacturing, transport distribution, intermediate use, and finally through to the consumer and the customer. And we are all consumers and customers. It's interesting, I'm based in Manchester, the Alliance uh, Manchester Business School talks about mundane sectors, and these are said to be economically important, but not necessarily uh, politically uh, visible. So it's not really a sector or sectors 
that people would think of in terms of innovation. Um, I'm here to tell you that the packaging sector is vibrant. It's looking for partners. It's looking to develop and integrate new technologies into their supply chains. So today, I thought would be an excellent opportunity to launch this particular report. It runs to 40 odd pages. Um, we're saving the planet, so it is only available electronically. It's there as a, as a PDF. And really the next slide is just to tell you where to get it from. So if you want to ring me at any stage, um, just ring that number. Um, I can talk you through the report, happy to take any questions. Um, it will be available to everyone uh, here in the room and on the, uh, the WebEx. Um, so the link will be given to you automatically. But if you want a copy today, advanced reading, uh, just email me. I'll be here if you want to take a copy on a, a stick or whatever it is available. Um, I'd like to close with just three points. One, it's quite amazing the range of um, different technologies that we've highlighted in the report that the sector is focusing on. Um, packaging is central to all of our lives. Um, and a great example I would cite would be the packaging used by Apple. So when you pick up your new uh, Apple Mac or your new iPhone, the packaging is superb in terms of its design and functionality. Um, but it does use plastic. Uh, and there are clearly key areas where plastic is essential for use in, in packaging. The second point is the packaging sector is open for innovation. It's looking for partners. And it's more than happy to share its expertise in previous uh, expeditions into securing funding, either from Europe or locally here via Innovate UK and the research councils. My final point, the packaging sector clearly is at the forefront of all of the current um, publicity relating to single-use plastic, um, it's an ideal opportunity to really gauge and understand a little bit more about the sector. So the report is here to help you do that. But also, it's really being subject to a lot of new demands, new materials, new processes, new methods of recovery. It's a prime time for innovation. Thank you. Contact details are there. The report is available. Thank you.